Greetings, dear ones. I'm Cryon of Magnetic Service. For those listening to this who are not here, this is the beginning message from the place you would call Monument Valley. It rings with the love of the earth. It's beautiful. And the group that is assembled with me here in person will get to experience it, see it, feel it. There's very little cement here. You're walking where the dirt is. The meditation that preceded this channel was words that I have given before. The sentiment echoed before about those who lived here. And they lived here hundreds and hundreds of years before anyone else got here. And I want to talk about that just briefly. There is an alliance with Gaia possible today. All of the shift that we have talked about has attributes of reawakening, relearning, things that the ancients knew. And you can't just take yourself out of the city because that's where you exist and that's where your families are. So there has to be a way of the alliance with Gaia that works for you better now even than then. And that's what we wish to discuss. The alliance with Gaia is a consciousness. It doesn't mean you have to be in a certain place. But here is where you get the full whammy, if you want to say, of the energy of the land as it speaks to you, as it wants to talk to you, maybe even in remembrance. I want you to know that that alliance that the ancients had is what we wish to have rekindled in this the great shift. And this is something that will be echoed over and over in the messages of Cryon as you go forward in these days and see the magnificence of what Gaia could look like. Oh, I'll weigh in a little bit, perhaps more, about what happened here. But the result today, in this year, as you look upon it, is majestic. This is the way the ancients looked upon it as well. They knew of the sacredness of this place, of what the monuments meant to them, the names they gave them, and all about the love of Gaia. This was their partner. And that is not something you can claim today easily, even with light workers. It's the missing link. It must be rekindled. The second thing I want to tell is the elephant under the table. There will be many listening to this. Perhaps it's even controversial. But it's one of the things that you must know because of what has happened here and because of the residual from the crystalline grid. The ancients were fine with this until the conquerors came. And all over the world you find the similarity of this, that the conquering hemisphere did its job yet again. Even within its own hemisphere it conquered this land. And What I want to tell you about is the attitude, what happened, and what the land speaks of even today. Dear ones, perhaps you would know that the ancients did not own land. In fact, the concept is foreign to them. It's too linear. In fact, it's even childlike. Now, they will not tell you that because it's insulting and they will not insult you. But they don't know about ownership. When they would look at the horizon, it belonged to them. If there were disagreements, perhaps even wars between the ancients, it was over the resources, but not over the ownership. 
They understood that Gaia was a partner. It was alive. It was them. They didn't own it. They didn't draw lines that said, don't cross over this mind, yours. They didn't segment it into parcels and record them in some library. So when the conquerors came, the idea of who owned what did not even go into their consciousness. They had a difficult time with an actual lower consciousness. And so I will tell you something that they don't say very often. That they saw the conquerors as the savages. Savages with higher technology is what they said. Because the savages had no concept of the glory and the beauty of a Gaia that nobody could own. I want you to ponder that and think of that. Because the result is the third item I, I cover. The result is this land has sadness. Not pain. It just has sadness. The crystalline grid has sadness. As you look upon this and your eyes take in all the majesty, think of yourself as an ancient who used to say, it's open for anybody. That has created a sadness. The invitation for all listening, for all here, is to begin to rewrite that into the shift that has gone on into a celebration. Mix it in with forgiveness, with compassion, and reawaken the sadness and rewrite the crystalline grid wherever you walk. This is one of the attributes of why you're here. Finally, I know not all of you came for the channeling. I know who's here. And I want to say to you, that everything we speak about is simple. Whether you believe in what is going on or not, the message is something to ponder. The love of God is here. Knows your name. Knows what has happened here. And is ready to accelerate the energy to any degree that you wish. Simple. Nothing to join, nothing to belong to. No doctrine, no prophet. Only messages of beauty from the creator of what you're looking at right now. And that is the message to begin this trip. It's a good one. Let's continue. And so it is. In an excursion like this, we have lots of people who would not necessarily ever come to a cry on seminar. And without studying what I've said or what's happened, perhaps you don't realize this whole idea of the shift, the idea of what's going on on the planet right now is not new age. I didn't make this up. This is history. And what makes this so profound is that the ones who gave us the prophecies were the ancients, not the ones that you got when you were, when you were growing up. None of what the ancients have said you will find in Scripture, which we call the Holy Bible, or Nostradamus, or any of the modern-day prophets. It's just not there. The ones who prophesied the great shift were the ones watching the stars for generations. We originally got interested in this and what they said, and I went to Mexico to check it out, and that was the Mayans. All of this talk about the Mayan calendar. And that's where I started learning it what they said, what they meant. And my journey took me to talk to the elders of the Lakota, who had the same doggone prophecy. They didn't know each other. And then you get into the Hopi. The Hopi Indian rock is, is a prophecy scratched onto the rock. You'll see, it talked about the precession of the equinoxes and the decisions of light and dark. And it's almost like the earth would stop and everybody would have to make a decision. And that is what the Crian's message is. It's about no more fence sitting. That really it is boiling down to light and dark. And what do we see in the Middle East? We see a, an army 
there's an evil army without borders, without a country, without even a current language that, that they speak together. That is an army of evil. This is all the prophecies that the ancients have said were in it. The Mayans said that if we would pass 2012, that, that wobble of the earth center, that precession of the equinox, if we pass it, it's going to be a new ball game. And it's going to be about consciousness. And that's why we're here. And no better place. When Elon says, let's go to Monument Valley, I went to the first thing, first thing I said was, why? <laughs> I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And that's when I first started seeing release. But that's the center. That's the center. It's not the four corners, but it could be. It's just the center of the, it's the great Native American desert. It's, it's the place where the ancients prophesied this here. So what better place to honor an energy we're in that was prophesied not by any of the writings we had as Westerners or any of the scripture that we had as Westerners because none of that came true. Do you, do you realize none of that came true? If you study your scripture, we are gone. 2000, we were going to have the Armageddon. We're going to have the nuclear war. We're going to have all of those things. And it didn't happen. Flat out didn't happen. We're 16, 17 years later. There are those still expecting it not realizing it didn't happen. You know, because they read it, it had to happen. It didn't. And now we're on to something brand new. And the ones who, if you want to take a look at what's going to happen and what has been said, you look at the ancients. They're the ones who has prophesied this. That's why I'm sitting here. Hardly is it new age. It's about as old as it gets. And so that's, that's why Cryon is here giving these messages to rekindle us to the things of the past. And to make it make sense to us, not, not some highfalutin thing that, that's in the clouds, but practical things, because we have to go back to work. And so that's why we're here. The channels are short, and they're always ones of celebration. They always honor where they are and the human being. I've never been here. I get excited just looking at all this stuff. Um, I get excited that it belongs to the Navajo. <laughs> I get excited that I can look at it and it's in peace. Let's begin. Greetings, dear ones. I'm Cryon of Magnetic Service. My partner has said it all. You sit among prophecy and Gaia. And I'm not going to leave this alone. I want to make you understand the Alliance, a consciousness that is so much higher than what most who listen to this have. It's a consciousness right here, developed right here, which had an Alliance, which was so strong that there really was no difference between spirit, the creative source, and Gaia. Gaia fed and clothed all of them. The ancients had this alliance, and it was so strong that it soothed them. Mother Earth. Let's talk about that first. Is there a practical feeling you get Something that is, that is not esoteric, a practical feeling you get when you think about the love of the earth. Ask a tree hugger. When they hug a tree, does it hug them back? And the answer is always yes. That there is an essence that comes from the earth that pours out if you allow it, if you feel it. In some lands, and we have discussed where the, where the grids are different, it pours out in a different way. The visits to Ireland, where my partner goes next, is an example. Where Gaia is almost untethered and pours out to such a degree that for centuries, those have seen the little people, the, the manifestations literally, of the love of Gaia and the communications 
in all of their lands. That's from the earth. And here, in this desert, it's different. It's a quiet, beautiful, serene love that pours from the planet in its quietness. And those who would sit and ponder it can feel it. Make it practical. When you think about Gaia and you think about what is the Earth's relationship to me, if you do that, expect the results. You might find a partner, even in your backyard, that you don't expect. This is the alliance that has been lost. The rekindling of this is the invitation to make your life complete, more complete spiritual, in a way that perhaps you hadn't thought of before. The Western world often sits and meditates, direct connection to the source, whatever, to spirit, to God, bypassing the earth completely, not understanding that it is sitting there as a partner, ready to enhance the relationship between that which is you and that which is God. What kind of an alliance? It's almost supernatural. It is supernatural. Define supernatural. That is above what you think is normal. And that's because Westerners don't have necessarily the consciousness of the indigenous. The indigenous were so allied with the planet so connected that when we did it, when they had needs and, and they did ceremonies of alliance, which you might have called rain dances, these ceremonies allied themselves with the planet in such a way that when they needed food, dear ones, I mean, let me tell you something. Even the elders have forgotten some of these things because they're old, 300 years ago or more. They needed food, sometimes the buffalo or other would literally wander into the camp as if on cue. And every single part of the animal would be used and honored. Ceremony would happen because Gaia provided. The animals had an alliance with Gaia and the indigenous with Gaia, they're connected. It's why sometimes you'll see the animals in the wild and you cannot decide what you're looking at. Is it Gaia? Is it an animal? Because they're all aligned together. That's an alliance. That's what we're talking about. Oh, there's more. Talking about Gaia supporting humanity. Even today, you don't think about it. And you say, well, that was then, not now. We have our, our food packaged and delivered. <laughs> and sometimes it's good. <laughs> but what about then? And what about now that still exists that you don't ever think of? If you take a child to the forest and the waterfalls, the children will sense that there's something special. You see, the air is fresher. They'll, in their mind, have a perception. Going to the forest is, is a place that's, that's fresher and, and, and good. And they'll want to go again and again and again, not realizing they have no concept of photosynthesis. The trees are pouring out the purest oxygen you'll ever have. The waterfalls are supplying the negative ionization for the personalities to feel better. Do you realize that as you breathe in, the next breath, that's Gaia, designed to give you oxygen, designed to absorb that which you exhale. If there isn't a partnership, that's, you, what, else, what would you say that is? What would you say that is? That's an alliance. You need each other. You need each other in such a way that is so profound, and yet, often there is no even second thought about it. I invite anyone who's listening to have a small ceremony, perhaps daily, lasts only 30 seconds, 
Maybe it's when you get up. Maybe it's when you, when you go to bed, which would be appropriate. This is thank you, Gaia, for the partnership. I may not have my feet in the dirt, but I know who you are. Bless this day as the partnership we have together. In a later channeling, I would like to give you a scenario that will be controversial. I have given a portion of it before. I want to tell you geologically what happened here. I'm going to call it uh, anti-geology because it is not accepted. I'll call about the great geological bias of the day and what they've got wrong. Because there is a magnificent thing that has happened here to create all of this in a time frame that no one expects. And the land just yells with it. It says, yes, yes. And when I tell you, many of you will look again with a different eye. That's coming up. But for now, so it is. I invite you to close your eyes and take a deep breath. And as you exhale, think of the symbiotic relationship that we share with Gaia. Breathing in her oxygen and giving back our carbon dioxide. Everything we have and do is connected with Gaia. This is what our ancestors knew. Our ancestors were also connected to the Creator through Gaia. Their intuition would tell them where to go to hunt. Their intuition would tell them that the Creator was here for them and that life was in a circle and a cycle. Many of them foretold what would happen on the planet, that we would come to this place and choose the high path, the path of high consciousness. And so now it is up to you. What are you going to do with this? How are you going to communicate to Gaia? How are you going to communicate to others? That is your free choice. And in all of what you choose to do, your decision is supported and you have a whole legion and entourage of spirit, angels, benevolent energies and cryon right by your side, walking every step you take. Ponder this and know how special you are. Greetings, dear ones. I am Cryon of Magnetic Service. In this, the third channel, the message remains about Gaia. For the listener, it will be sunset soon. And the group around me stands, some sitting, enjoying that which is still Monument Valley and will continue to be for the next few days. Dear ones, these channelings are not long because I want to make them a period, a point at the end of the day, almost a benediction that you would remember and let the main teaching be during the day. In order to do this correctly, I need you to visualize with me something. Humans are great with stories. They love stories. The greatest storytellers of all time were always the elders, for they had the greatest wisdom and information. The story I wish to give you this day is simple, rather short, and it's about a character that we often use in a parable, and the character's name is woe. Now, every time we use this character, I tell you that woe is genderless. Woe 
is a woman. He is both. As it should be, because this particular message is for all humanity. But in a story, we make him a man for this time. Woe was a spiritual man, an ordinary man, a man who lived in the city like so many of you, had a good job. And all through his life, Woe was, was constantly trying to make the vibration higher between himself and God. Woe was a good man. And all of the efforts he had didn't seem to accomplish what his friends were doing. And so he would get advice. He would ask, what can I do to have some of the experiences you have? For I know you've had visions. And they said, oh, yes. How do you do it? Whoa, you've got to keep your eye on God. You've got to meditate and pray in a way that you are always available for the visions to happen, to be there, to be filled with the light that comes from the sky. Woe would try so often to be just a little higher than he was. He would envision shafts of light coming from the clouds and beyond that, the creator of all, perhaps even the Holy One. He heard some of the visions that his friends had had. Literally, in a meditation, an out-of-body experience where they were taken up by angels, where they were looking down upon all things, where they actually had seen the face of the Holy One. He was so envious and then realized that was inappropriate. Woe wanted this so much. Woe didn't really believe he deserved it, but he knew his friends had it. So he got advice from his church, and his church loved him and gave him good advice. Woe, you have to fill yourself with the compassion of the Holy One. Woe, you have to kneel a little longer, perhaps. Take a little more seriousness, and, and you'll get there, woe. It was loving advice. It was good advice to help Woe get beyond himself and get into a higher vibration. And he tried. He tried many things. He got advice from many friends. It still didn't work. Woe didn't think that it was a problem. Not really. He knew he was loved by God. He was all right with it. He just figured that in this state of worthiness that he was, that's all he was going to get. And it was good enough for him. And then it happened. When you don't expect it, often things will happen to you because you then release that which you feel is necessary or, or the guilt or the disappointment. And he had released it all. It was late at night, actually, when Woe heard the voice. Woe, come outside. <laughs> oh, he knew. He knew what this was. He knew he was about to have something very special. He just didn't expect it at night. He stepped outside, and the voice continued. Whoa, we'd like to meet you. Oh, here it came. He knew it was going to come. But then he looked around him and he didn't expect what he saw. The ground beneath his feet was shimmering like so many gold pieces in the sun. He knew a vision was beginning for himself, but he didn't expect it to come from beneath. Suddenly he saw the equivalent of thousands of, of little candles all in a row leading him into the forest that was behind his home. He had been in that forest many times, but this wasn't leading him to what he was used to. He was in a vision. 
He saw the, the little people around him flitting around, and he said, Who are you? What is taking place? And they said, We are the divas of the forest. We are the ones to help you through the vision. Come, whoa, walk the path of light. And he did. And the path took him so gently into a very thick forest, not the one he was used to, majestic beyond belief, but it was lighted. All around him were dancing lights and, and seemingly more divas, perhaps even fairies, and that which would fly, lights everywhere. There was music or, or something like it. There was celebration. He could hear it. He could feel it. He was in his vision. He was beautiful. He loved what was happening to him. It just was so different than what he thought. He was led to a circle. And the circle was well illuminated, filled with light. And then he realized that the trees of the forest were starting to gather around him. Then he felt the branches start to then dip down and touch him very softly with their leaves. And when they did, he felt the electricity go through him. Oh, what a vision this was. He felt in, enabled every single time that, that a branch touched him, and then he heard a collective voice from all the trees. And he'll never forget it. Thank you, Woe, for letting us touch you, O Holy One. <laughs> and they said, as above, so below. And they continued. You have the Creator inside you, woe. And that is why we call you the Holy One. For this is how we see all humanity. Blessed are those who know the love of the earth is for them. We close the story there. Woe got his vision. And he also got a message. It doesn't always come from above. It's not what you think. And that as your feet touch the ground, the earth knows you as the Holy One. The ancients knew this story. And now you do too. And so it is. Greetings, dear ones. I'm Cryon a magnetic service. I want you to feel the stillness. It's not often that it is this way. The rocks are listening. If I told you, dear ones, that the rocks were alive, what would you say? For they don't match the scientific identity or definition of life. I've also told you that there will come a day when the definition of life will actually have to change. For science will come to the agree an agreement, I will call it, a confluence of discovery when they start to look at multidimensionality, identify it for what it is, and be able to measure it. And when they do, they will see the things in nature, in rocks and trees, that will redefine what is alive and what is not. And so when I say to you, the rocks are listening, in a certain way, not defined the way you think, they are. I would like to talk about science in this little period of time, in a way that would seem to be uncomplimentary but that's just the way it seems. It is the science of this planet which is driven you to this place. It's the science of the planet that will allow you to discover that which will then prove spirit. So it's coming, and it will be scientific. But the science of today has some biases. I would like to talk about that before I talk about that which is here in front of you. 
There are many kinds of science. There are the disciplines of science, the various studies. But scientists will tell you that truly there are two groups. The one group is trying to study the things that are and explain them. The other group tries to take that which is and project it to future causality. That means that they will be the ones who will invent that which you will use in the future. And the various kinds of science have different kinds of evidences. Various kinds of sciences don't have a lot of evidence so they create the machines that will produce them or the experiments that will show them. And so they are creating that which they will then examine and that then becomes their evidence through the creation. Then there are the other scientists that have a multitude of evidence in front of them all the time. Astronomy is one of those. The evidence is always there, always available to be studied. That kind of science is deciding what happened, when it happened, how it happened. That is much like geology. A geologist is faced with a multitude, a confluence of evidence that is so astonishingly great that they often don't know what they're looking at. Not only that, but the eons change that which they see. So as they take a look at one thing, for instance, the things that may be obfuscated completely is what happened to the eons before that which they're looking at. I want to tell you about the biases that occur. In science, it is supposed to be fresh. The scientific method is supposed to be one that excludes things that don't matter and includes things that do. It is supposed to be a method that is unbiased, but it is very biased. Let's take the one that I speak of often. Scientists in a field of their expertise believe they know certain things about what they've studied. And those certain things accumulate and create a bias so that they think they know where to look for the next discovery. So the bias becomes that which they think they're looking for. And then they design the experiments for that bias, not of a surprise, but of something they think is there, and that's the design of the experiment. The classic was the search for junk DNA. I've given to this before. For over 30 years, laying out before you was the chemistry of DNA that could not be solved. 90% of the chemistry of life itself was a mystery. Right up to the modern age, until 2012, it was considered unsolvable, even that which you would call junk, because there was no purpose that they could see. And the reason that it was so elusive is because it was being studied by life scientists, <laughs> chemists, and biologists, because they were looking for codes. They were looking for what they expected based upon what they saw in the past. They had made up their mind. This is where it's going to be, and looked there and found nothing. Then we told you later that the big discovery was from linguists who study word patterns. Because in that 90%, there was language. There was information. It's classic. The other one, which we haven't spoken of just yet, but we will in several weeks, is at the Large Hadron Collector. There they, they put tremendous energy to put the atoms of hydrogen together at almost the speed of light, crashing them, recording the explosions, and seeing what flies off. And they have trillions of photographs of what flies off. How do you analyze that and make any sense of it? They will tell you, well, they've designed programs. Programs that will look for that which they believe is there. Dear ones, they're going to find some of that, and in the process, they will miss what is really there. Because their program doesn't include looking for it. 
So you see, even in the highest physics, there is bias of the way you think things work and then designing the experiment around it. The great bias of geology is this. As long as you've been alive, dear ones, on this planet, geology works slow. There is the bias, therefore, that all geology has been extremely slow. And when you see something on the horizon, you make up your mind how long it took for it to be what it is. And you plug in what you believe to be true, that the erosion factors, the types of stones, the hardness and softness all weigh in to a very, very, very slow process. And that, dear ones, is completely wrong. <laughs> What the geologists don't expect is that when the earth was being formed in those millions of years ago, there was tremendous upheaval. And the processes involved were enormous. The weights of water on a newly formed earth, enormous. Things happened far faster than they thought. There are a few geologists who got the point with the explosion at Mount St. Helens when they got to see what they thought previously had taken hundreds of years happen overnight. And they realized that the process of a volcano can create things they didn't expect in a time frame that was never taught them in school. So let me tell you what you're looking at. And I'm going to elide it yet again with that which you've seen in the Grand Canyon. It's hard to describe this. And in geological terms, I will not. In plain English, I will. What you're looking at right now would have the attributes of thousands and thousands of years of wind erosion. There is a pattern to wind erosion and rain erosion. That's basically what you see. But underneath that, dear ones, what is really obfuscated and not seen as the way it is, is the ocean that was here. Not just an ocean, dear ones, but an ocean on the move. How do I tell you this? Almost to the continental divide, that which you call the Western United States had several major upheavals to literally let the ocean in and wash it back with land that tipped up and back again. Can you imagine that force of an entire ocean being released and coming in? And in its force for perhaps hundreds of years then to be reversed and let out again. I'll tell you that that Grand Canyon was cut in less than 300 years with an ocean ferocious, something you've never seen on this planet at this point. This planet is peaceful now. It's done with that kind of geology. It's done with that massive amount of movement in short amount of times. That's what the Earth was like. And if you could see this, you would understand that underneath what you think is wind erosion is water erosion. You can see what sticks up here and the, and the bed of the ocean that is here. They were islands. Waves crashing against them, eroding them to what you see today. That was the beginning. That was the mold of what you see today, which was then later eroded more with wind and with rain. Those who are here who live in other areas know You'll find seashells everywhere. This was an ocean. It wasn't a calm ocean. It was an ocean on the move. As the plates would lift and turn and lift and push. It was more than you could ever see. Movement which was more than expected from any geologist. Quick, fast, ferocious. And it made the hard cuts that you see everywhere. Straight up and down. A lot more than wind and rain, even through millions of years. 
So I want you to think of this, and I want you to remember this day, and I'll say it again, because there'll come a time when geologists will say, yes, we acknowledge this now. That's the science lesson for the day. I want you to look at these things with a different eye. I want you to look at the, the confluence of nature which created the beauty that is today the desert. And I want you to look out and see the ocean bed before you. Imagine the crashing waves, an ocean that was never still on the move. And how through hundreds of years and thousands back and forth this occurred. It's the reason there's a delta on both sides of the Grand Canyon. For it flowed one way and then the other way, and then one way and then the other way. Cutting what you see here in a majesty that you can look at today. Controversial? Of course. <laughs> and so it is. Okay, here I go. <clears throat> Way, yeah, 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 young, uh, hey, yeah, yeah, young, uh, yo, when the young, uh, yo, when the young, uh, away, hey, yeah, 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 young, uh, yo, when the young, uh, yo, when the young, uh, away, hey, yeah, 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 young, uh, you hung, uh, you hung, uh, you hung, uh, hung, uh, hung, uh, you hung, uh, you hung, uh, hung, uh, hung, uh, Yo, when the young are away, hey, 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 young up, so all a day, hey, 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 so all a day, hey, 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 she can't love with yet, none of them, she didn't love with yet, none of them, hey, she don't hold yonder, oh, no, shut all the yo, oh, yo, oh, yo, oh, wait, hey, 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 young up. Yo, when the young are, yo, when the young are away, yo, hey, yeah, 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 oh, hey, yeah, 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 hey, yeah. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Nice from the rain. <laughs> okay, this is the one that I shared with the group yesterday, so here it goes. Yaha, hey, 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 oh, 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 oh,
that the ceremonies were given in order to create harmony with the land, harmony with the family, harmony with the tribe. This is a high consciousness, dear ones. It is a consciousness that would try its best to harmonize with all around it. Instead of taking from it or being opposed to it. It is a concept which is still not here. But there's more. I told you that the planet which you call Gaia was a partnership. So let me take you back. Let's go 400 years. Here. That's double the lifespan of your country. Here. 400 years. The rocks aren't just listening. The rocks are talking. If you have a partnership with the earth, it is critical that you would have those who knew how to hear what the rocks were saying. The rock formations, as you go around this monument valley, are now being given names. But before that, they were given energies, personalities. And in the energies, there was the male, there was the female. Some had sacredness. Some you didn't go to. There was the yin and the yang even then. There was the polarity even then. But the shaman, which now you are calling in this land, the medicine man, the medicine woman, had a process, a procedure, if you want to say, of learning and wisdom that took a very long time in order to hear what the land would say. You might understand that even back then, before any chemistry, they had potions that would heal. And those healing potions came directly from the land, from the plants, even some of the animals, in cooperation and harmony with humans, one helping the other. It is so obvious why the indigenous would want to give back in ceremony to that partner which had given them so much. The more harmonious you can be with the land and that which is around you, the longer you live. The more beneficial you'll be to others. The more compassion you can show. There are questions, how would the medicine man know what berries or parts of animals or salves to use in order to heal? Was it trial and error? Did they have a laboratory? <laughs> and the answer is the land told them. The rocks told them. Because you see, the rocks speak. And if your consciousness is allied to the planet to such a degree that you are one with it, you'll know what they say. What you see in the chair right now is called channeling, and that is the word of today. Perhaps the indigenous would be open enough to share with you what it was called back then because they used it back then as well. Only elders, only of a certain age and a certain lineage would be able to then speak for the rocks. But as you look at the monuments, as you call them now, and those beautiful sculptures of nature, understand that each one of them had a personality. It still does, if you ask an elder. This is a partnership. Dear ones, that's what's missing. I'll tell you finally this. It's a two-way street with the planet. If the planet knows you are endeavoring to honor it, it responds. It knows who you are, because the partnership must be that way. 
It's more personal today because of the shift of the precession of the equinoxes, of the prophecies of the ancients that is now coming true. Again, I will say there is a famous etching called the Hopi Indian Rock talking about this very time where the path of humanity splits and the choice is yours to go one way or the other. The prophecy of the Hopi is the same prophecy of the Lakota, of the Peruvian, of so many on the planet that say this is the time where the East, the West, the North, and the South will come together in a confluence of understanding. Will there be compassion where there was no compassion before, understanding where there was no understanding before, and a very slow remake of consciousness on Earth. And in the process of learning this, you turn to the ancients, for they had the truth. The planet knows you seek and will respond. And so it is. Greetings, dear ones. I'm crying of magnetic service. Indeed, it has been a beautiful day. I want to review just a little bit. And then I want to turn the page. If you think to yourself, what has been said so far in the previous five channelings? The message is simple. It's profound. It's beautiful. That this planet knows you. We spent a long time speaking of the esoterics of Gaia. Today, you heard from the Navajo the stories that they would tell about their traditions and who they are and what they do here. Overwhelmingly, you get the sense of harmony. Not only is there harmony with the planet, there is harmony with themselves, with their families. I told you of the geology this morning, the controversy. Even to extend that, I tell you that everything I told you happened before life on the planet in the early days of the formations of what you see. There have been mass weather cycles since that time that would put lakes and small oceans here yet again and turn them to deserts and back and forth. You've had little seas here with life in them, hence the shells. There is so much here that hides in history. But the greatest history here is what the indigenous have accomplished. Review. We tell you that as you study them, you find the truth of Gaia and the wonderful relationship to the human being. Now I wish you to turn the page just briefly it's one thing to live in harmony with the planet when you're on the reservation. You're in a group that has traditions that are so old that they can't count the years. Here the, the ones who live here are free to believe what they wish, but the traditions are strong. And the tradition of harmony within the family is strong. And so that is not that difficult to continue the relationship of the ancients of the past on their own land. But what about you? This is the crux of my teaching. In a modern age, when you leave here, how can you possibly carry out what you see? You go back to that which you would call the city life. Even if you're not in the city, you have a westernized life. 
You don't have the traditions around you. You don't have the, the family that is cooperating because they have for 500 years. You will have those who would look at you and have no concept of an elevated consciousness of a 24-7 relationship to the planet. I talked to those of you, some of those of here, some listening, that long ago realized you don't switch on and off God. It's not a Sunday experience. What you do is you carry the relationship 24-7. Before you go to bed tonight, some of you say things. When you get up, you say things. Not unlike those who would then talk to the sun and the moon, celebrate that in ceremony. But it's difficult for you because you don't have the group around you. Spirit knows this. The teaching is this, dear ones, that the harmony that you carry, that you see here in the tribe that you've learned is so precious and beautiful to hear. You have got to be self-contained with it. And you've got to then emulate the compassion of what you see here without a tribe. That is work. And that is why you are a light worker. You're going to have to carry your own traditions with you. The tradition of the beauty and the compassion of God. Of a relationship to the planet that is far more than anything that the Western world appreciates, understands, or even considers. And here you are living it. By yourself, perhaps, if you don't have an alliance with your partner, with your family, you live it by yourself. But the good news, the news that is special since the precession of the equinoxes, is that it literally pushes out and people see it. You might even say it's catchy. And people will come to you and see the peace you have and will say, how do you do it? And you can tell them gently that you've discovered something that gives you peace in your heart. That helps you with the anxious anxieties of the, the problems of day to day. You are harmonizing with the planet. And in that process, you are literally pushing that outside of yourself so that others can see it. I've said it so often. The masters of the planet, as they walked around, they... They had a following, not because they did this or that, but because people wanted to be with them. Listen. It's peaceful, isn't it? It's nice to hear. It's nice to feel. That can be you. Standing in the city with turmoil all around you, with anxiety, day-to-day -day living, pushing the envelope of the stress level of each of you. And you can go inside and claim the truth that you learn here. This is the hard one. That's why you're here. That's why this was chosen. So you can see the emulation. You can see the model and the template. And you can go back and create something that has not been created before. Peace on earth. One at a time. It's catchy. I mean by that, it's almost infectious. Like laughter, beauty, good art and music. People want you around. They'll ask questions. I guarantee there will be those who will come to you and ask, what is it you have? And that is the harmony time. That's when you can start telling those around you that they don't have to be in stress. Dear ones, this is the message, and it will continue to be the message, even this week, the message, that this is the template that you can take home individually and practice. You're never alone. The planet knows what you're doing. Spirit knows what you're doing. You're never alone. 28 years ago, I started in this process with my partner to some degree. 
and it's graduated to this. And if there is a, a slogan, if there's a saying, if there's anything that has repeated itself all of those years, it's that you're never alone. Can you cognize that? Can you believe it to the point where you can take this with you? We'll talk more about that. But until that time, the rest of these days, I want you to feel everything you can feel. Because you're in the right place at the right time for this. Feel the, the tranquility now, the peace that is here. There's nothing like it. You can take it home and have it to yourself and spread it as much as you can, as much as you wish. And so it is.